Here's a sneak peek for this week's episode. Like the main joys of visiting the Mississippi come from slowing down. I'm Scott. And I'm Melissa. And we are the Sunshine Travelers. Our passion is travel and sharing our experiences with those who enjoy it as much as we do, or those who want to learn more about travel, or even those who just want to live vicariously through our travel stories. No matter where you fall along that journey, get ready to hear about our firsthand experiences as we visit some of the most interesting and amazing places on Earth. This week, we talked to author and podcast host Dean Klingenberg about some ideas for visiting some unique locations along the wild Mississippi. Dean will share some of his memories from researching the book and give some suggestions of places to visit that you may not be familiar with. So pack your bags and bring your hiking shoes as we travel with Dean down the Mississippi River. In this episode, we want to give people who may be looking for domestic travel options, or if you're thinking about maybe you want to travel but don't want to fly anywhere, we want to give you a few trip ideas. Last week, we discussed Amelia Island for those seeking a beach destination. In episode 48, we talked about the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, and in episode 30, we focused on New Orleans. We'll list a few other episodes in the show notes to help give you some ideas about U.S. based destinations to visit this summer. But in this episode, we will be exploring the Mississippi River and learning new things that we never knew about this magnificent body of water with a rich history into itself. So Dean said in his podcast that as Americans, we want to travel and see the great rivers of the world, such as the Nile and the Amazon. But we have such a great river here in the U.S. that we often take for granted. Or he said a lot of people just go and see the river and move on to the next thing or see the other things around it. And I think we are guilty of that, the times that we have been to see the Mississippi. So let's bring Dean in now and hear what he has to tell us about the Mississippi River. Our guest today is Dean Klinkenberg, author of The Wild Mississippi. He is also the host of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. So we're excited to have Dean on the show. Welcome to our show, Dean. Well, hi, Melissa and Scott. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah, excellent. We were just talking earlier is that as we look through and your book and we've listened to some of the podcast episodes and things like that, there's a real good synergy between what we like to do with our listeners, which is to help them travel more and better. And, you know, you've pulled out some really great things about the Mississippi that I didn't even know existed. And so we're just really excited to talk to you about that. Well, thanks. I mean, flatter me all you want. So keep that coming. That's great. Well, I've been doing it for a while. So hopefully I know a few places at this by this time. Yeah. Well, give us a little background about you, what, you know, what sparked your interest in writing about the Mississippi River? So I got hooked on the Mississippi when I was a college kid. I kind of grew up in suburbs and small towns in the Midwest. And high school, I graduated from a a small town high school in the middle of the plains in southern Minnesota. So, you know, we were surrounded by cornfields and, you know, soybean fields and those kinds of things. I chose to go to school in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I still remember clearly in my head that first drive where you take Interstate 90 from Albert Lee to La Crosse and you're going east. And just before you get to La Crosse, you pass through all this farmland. And just before you get to La Crosse, the road starts to dip down and turn a little bit. And then just before you opens up this incredible river valley. And it's 500 plus feet down from where we just were. So you head down these bluffs and you see this expansive valley with the river and multiple channels and, and islands that are covered in green. And uh, that kind of got my attention right away. And those years in lacrosse, I got to spend a lot of time near or on the river. You know, like a lot of kids, I was kind of moody and working out some stuff. And uh, I like to bike, you know, ride my bike down to the riverside and I'd sit there and think for a little while. And the bluffs along that area are about 500 feet tall and there are lots of hiking trails. And I'd, I love going for a hike up and, and around the bluffs. And and just sitting on the edge of a bluff and looking out over this valley, you can see for 30, 40 miles. And so that's really when I got hooked on the river itself. But it was many years after that before I started writing about it. Great. Yeah. You know, there's a saying that if you're ever having a bad day, just go to the water and give it 15 minutes. And it'll totally change your perspective and attitude. 
absolutely. I've heard this from so many people too. In fact, somebody I was just talking with today said the same basic thing uh, on the upper part of the river where he likes going there just because it helps him calm down. Yeah, and I've talked with vets, combat vets, who talked about their struggles with PTSD, who really found most of their peace and solace from time on the river, you know, on the water. So there's something uh, therapeutic and magical about water. Well, let's jump in and talk a little bit about the book. You've got a book that's going to release on May 21st, and it's called The Wild Mississippi. It's on the YouTube, so anyway. Yeah, <laughs> got a copy of it there. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about the book and, you know, what what's your thoughts on on this for people who might pick this up and want want to use it? And, you know, how, how did you intend for this to be used? When I did finally get around to start writing about the river, I wrote guidebooks for people who are driving you know, along the Great River Road. So I've got a book called Road Tripping the Great River Road that only covers the upper half of the river, but it was geared toward people who might be interested in the cultural, historical aspects, where to eat, where to stay, that kind of thing, and not as much about the environment of the river. And over time, you know, it, it got through my thick skull finally that the attraction here really is the river itself and how well do we all really understand that, uh, what the river really is. So Timber Press approached me about writing this book, and right away I understood I needed to do this. It's a good companion to the other book, but this book really focuses just on the natural world of the Mississippi. So the first half of the book provides kind of a description of the different ecosystems, wetlands, forests, that kind of thing, grasslands and prairies, and describes what those ecosystems are like and what kind of life they support. And then the second half of the book goes through all 10 states, the Mississippi touches and lists public lands that people can visit to get close to the river. So I think there are 166 public places listed in this book. I really wanted something that would help encourage people to spend time to slow down when they're at the river and spend time looking at the river and taking it in and trying to see the river as uh, valuable unto itself, I guess. Like, so many of us look at the big rivers and we think of transportation. You know, we think about barges mm -hmm. and the Mississippi. You know, it's our Amazon. You know, it, it's far much more. It's far more than just a place to ship bulk products. But I think most of us don't fully understand how the river works and all the different parts and how important it is for all those parts to be connected. So I'm hoping this book will help people see it like that. Yeah, and what I think is great about it is that you really have the best of both worlds in it, right? So for people who are interested in the different types of, you know, landscapes that you will find, like you mentioned, the swamps and the estuaries and the prairies and and then the animals as well. So you have whole sections on what fish you'll find and what mammals you'll find and, and how to look for them. And the fact that because the bald eagle population has risen so much, right, you're likely to see the bald eagle nest and and things like that, but then also just as a practical guide, right? So where can I go to a state park and what can I do there? You know, where can I ride bikes? Where can I hike? Where can I, you know, do some of these fantastic trails? And so you really lay out both of those things. So I think a diverse, you know, population will really in enjoy that for, you know, to meet their needs of their travel. Yeah. So one of the things you, in my head, I'm kind of, I think of it kind of like a city guide. If you, if that model, if you bought a, bought a guidebook for Paris, you would get a history of Paris. You would get a, a layout of the city, the neighborhoods, but you're not going to get a description of every single building in Paris. Right. Uh, I could not describe every single life form that exists along the Mississippi. It would be, you know, a hundred books, maybe like that. So it's not a field guide in the sense of like a birding guide. There are, I do talk about different kinds of life, but if you're really intent on finding a way to identify that bird or that plant, you'll probably need some supplemental resources to do that. So I just want, I want to make sure people understand how, yeah, I kind of, kind of thought about this book. You know, one of the things, uh, Melissa and I both grew up in the South and we always think about the Mississippi as being part of the South. And I, I never, you know, you mentioned that it's 10 states connected to the to the mississippi and you know i just scratched my head and was like gosh there's so much about the mississippi that i have no clue about even though we've been to 
Mississippi in places like Mississippi and 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 so forth. I you know I think about you said prairies, and I would never associate a prairie with the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's in, I, it wouldn't have been the top of my head either when I started this book, but I began to realize like there are a couple different kinds of prairies along the river, and some of them are at river level. Of course, the river touched on tall grass prairies before you know the areas that were tall grass prairies before we turned them into farms. And there are even prairies in Arkansas and Louisiana where you wouldn't expect to find them, but for different reasons than you have them in the middle part of the country. And then up north, you know, on the top of bluffs, we have these things we call goat prairies. Um, and they're basically just these clear patches of prairie on top of the bluffs that a lot of, you know, for many generations, they were managed with fire. You know, indigenous mm-hmm. people, Native Americans use fire to keep those, those clear. But today we still burn them some to, get, to manage it that way. But yeah, there's all these different prairies. I think that's one of the fun things. I One of the things I like so much about doing this book is it just, it opened up my own mind so much about all these different ecosystems and different types of habitats along the river. And you can find so many different little pockets of life that are completely different from each other. And sometimes they're only, you know, 50 feet away. Well, let's talk about some of the places that you discuss in the book. One of the things that you said that resonated with me is the places that you chose, it wasn't just somewhere where you could get out of the car uh, and or go for a short hike and see water, right? There was something to do in each of the locations. Yeah, I mean, that was important to me. There are some, some places that uh, really provide a nice view and not much else. And I like those places too, but I kind of figured if you're traveling along the river, and you're going to stop to get out of your car for a little bit, you want to be able to walk around and see something. So, you know, I tried to pick places that, you know, to me were easy to get to. You know, there were some places I went to where I I really, I kind of white knuckled a little bit, not because there was a cliff or anything, but because of the mud that I was afraid of getting stuck. Or I didn't want to include places that might be difficult to get to, or you might need four wheel drive to get in and out of. So they're accessible. And when you get there, there's something to do. And most of them, it's a hike. You know, and most of these places, it's, it's trails or it's walking along the riverbank. But it's something you can spend at least a half hour, if not more, walking around. Yeah. And that's great, too, because like if somebody is traveling there and let's say that they, you know, are, they fly and they need to rent a car, right? And so then they don't, you know, they won't have access to those four-wheel drives. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's excellent. And then you also mentioned a lot of places where you could rent the bikes or you could rent, you know, the watercraft or, or whatever in some of these places that are, you know, state parks or different or different places. Yeah, there are a lot of options, a lot of opportunities to do things in, in many of these folks. And, it, and I, honestly, I think there's more of that on the upper half of the river than the lower half, but we can get into that a little bit too. Yeah, look forward to it. I mean, talking about the flying somewhere and getting in the car, I loved what you said where, you know, so many people fly to a destination, they rent the car, they go to the Mississippi and they say, okay, I've done it. And they turn around and, and leave. And so this book is really about helping you get beyond just that visual, there's the mighty Mississippi and, uh, and, and really get on to experiencing it. Yeah. And I think that we are guilty of that, right? We were trying to th- think through when we have visited the Mississippi. And I think we came up with when my sister lived in Mississippi and we went over to Vicksburg for the day, right? And you two were around and you can, you know, take the trail and go see it. And then of course in New Orleans, right? But there it is what, and I guess that's what we end up thinking as the Mississippi is that you're, you're level with it, right? And then here you are and then here's the river, but then you're, what you're describing then in the North part of the river is that you have these really tall bluffs, right? Where, you know, and you're, you're up a lot higher and stuff like that. So, just the landscape as you, you know, travel to different places on the river, how different that's going to look and how wide it is versus how narrow it is. And then, of course, like we said, what you're, what you're going to find there. Can you share any, you know, interesting anecdotes or stories while you're spending time exploring and, you know, researching this book, maybe people that you ran into that had an impact on you? Yeah, boy, there's so many. One of the things that you really came away feeling good about, the number of people that are really connected to the river and care about it. Uh, there are, you know, 
I, I spent a lot of time in public lands, obviously. So you meet park rangers and you, you know, volunteers. Almost all these places rely heavily on volunteers for, you know, staffing, you know, the office or, you know, talking with visitors. And many of them rely on, on volunteers for pulling invasives or that kind of thing. So I felt really good about the number of people that are directly involved in trying to care for these places. So that was good. And of course, there are lots of people who fish. Like you can't walk along the Mississippi anywhere near a town and not find somebody fishing there. Mm-hmm. And it cuts across any you know demographic boundary you want to identify. It, it, just about anybody will go fish there. So those are all great. I had some fun experiences doing this uh, and some that I don't know if most people would consider them fun. But I remember hiking in a, uh, it was a national wildlife refuge near Vicksburg, actually, at St. Catherine Creek. And that was late fall or mid-fall, like October. And it was clear this trail did not get a lot of foot traffic. And I knew that because, you know, five minutes in, there was a giant spider web across the trail. And I kept finding spider webs across the trail. And there were these giant orb weavers in, in all of these webs. Now, I knew they were not dangerous. I wasn't especially bothered by them, but I also didn't really want to make them angry. So, you know, I, I was careful about working my way around them. But it was really fascinating to me. It kind of felt like, I know the world, the word wilderness can kind of get overused because we have changed so many of the wild places around us. But this place kind of felt a little untouched for a little while because there were so many of these spider webs across the trail. I felt like somebody, like an explorer almost, somebody who had, was seeing this for the first time. And I got some fun pictures, some good close ups of uh, spiders. So may not be everybody's idea of fun, though. Yeah, but that's neat. I mean, to be in a place where you think, I mean, this is really off the beaten path, right? Like there hasn't been somebody here, at least today. I know those spiders in the fall, they they work quickly. But, you know, at least today, like you're not in this in the place, you know, where thousands of people have traveled and, and seen that. So, yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah. And that was just a floodplain forest, you know, so, you know, just nearby me, the the, uh, the ground was pretty wet yet from the river being a little high at, the, at that particular point. So. I wasn't, you know, wandering through a forest far away from the river or high above. This was basically down in the floodplain. It was really cool, very atmospheric. Mm, Very neat. Well, let's jump into, you know, one of the things that we like to do, and we said this kind of early on, is help people travel more and better. And, you know, knowing that a lot of the people who listen to our podcast probably have a fairly limited exposure to the breadth of the Mississippi. Why don't we ask you to give us some locations for different parts of the year that you might recommend that people check out? And we can start with summer. You know, we got summer coming up, people thinking about planning their summer trip. What would you recommend for them? I think you probably want to go north for one thing. I mean, you you live in the south, so you know, I'm not sure you really want to be hanging around the Mississippi and Mississippi or Arkansas in July and August so much. <laughs> People do it, but probably you want to go for a shoulder season for that. So I'd go north and I I have some of my favorite spots, but I I really think people should get a good sense of how the river changes along its course to fully appreciate how this river develops and and the life it supports changes during its length. So the river starts, you know, we picked the starting point as the Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota at Itasca State Park. It's about four hours by car from Minneapolis. And I think it's just one of the most spectacular parks along the Mississippi, not just because we consider it where the river starts, but there are patches of old uh, old growth red and white pine, which are very rare anymore. We, we logged most of that long ago. Um, So you can get the experience of what the northern forests were like in this place. Plus, you can wade across the Mississippi, and they have a really nice lodge and cabins you can stay in, a a big campground. It's a very popular place in the summertime. If you're going to go and be there on a weekend, you probably should make advanced reservations to make sure you've got a room or a campsite. During the week, you may not need to. But I I love that spot a lot. And part of what I think about, too, is what kind of experience do you want? Because, you know, a lot, the Mississippi can offer just about anything you want. And if you want an outdoors experience, that's one thing. If you want more of the city experience along the river, Minneapolis and St. Paul are both really vibrant cities. And 
you could spend weeks there with uh, without running out of things to do or seeing the same thing twice. And the, the riverfront through Minneapolis and St. Paul is really beautiful and designed for public access. So there are bike trails that run along both banks of the river in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's a fantastic place to be in the summertime. It can get hot, but not like you know Mississippi hot or Florida hot. I think that's a great point because it's not all spiders in your face. There, there are these large cities that are located along the Mississippi as well. Absolutely. So I, you know, I think that's one of the things you start with is what kind of experience you're looking for. And there are plenty of places you can have more of the outdoors experience. And I, you know, I think in the book, you know, Minnesota was probably the hardest state for me to narrow down my choices for which public lands to include because there are so many and so many really interesting ones. So you know, if you go south of the Twin Cities, out south of St. Paul, the river enters an area called the, the Driftless Area. And this is a, you'll, 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 yeah, you'll, you probably wonder if you left the Midwest and ended up in New England or some other part of the country, because the terrain looks so different from everything around there. Rolling hills, some steep valleys and places, lots of creeks and rivers, beautiful exposed limestone bluffs. Lots of forests, a lot of public lands. It's just, it's a really beautiful part of the river. And through there, the river valley is three to five miles wide, but it's framed by these majestic limestone bluffs on both sides. So you feel very much like you're in a river valley. And there's, there are a lot of opportunities for outdoor activity in that stretch of the river and a whole bunch of small towns that cater to, to visitors. There's one stretch called Lake Pepin, which is a natural widening in the river's channel. And there, it's surrounded by small towns, and almost all of them have vacation rentals. Some of them have people who take sailboat trips out on that stretch of the river. There's good food. I mean, it's surprisingly good food in some of these smaller communities. Artists have shops. So you can have kind of a mix of experiences through there. If you want more of the historical, cultural experience, you can do that. If you want to get on the river and do some hiking and other places, there are a lot of opportunities for that too. Hmm. So that sounds good. So you could you could have a city experience. You could go to some of these state parks and recreation sites and then explore some of the small towns. And so, I mean, I know that doesn't give people a lot of time, but if they had a, like a, say a week in the summer to take a vacation, like they could, they could kind of hit a lot, yeah, quite so a can, few. You could easily spend a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And for me, like one of the hardest things is telling people how much time to spend like, for doing some of these things. And I think it's this is where you have to decide your priorities when you're traveling. What do you really want to see and do? And, you know, if they, I really like the idea of being able to spend time at the river. Obviously, that's why I wrote this book. And if you have the chance to sort of stay in one place for two or three days, I think you tend to see a little bit more, especially if you can watch how the river changes during the day. Mark Twain wrote pretty eloquently about what a sunrise is like. I'm not much of a morning person, so I prefer sunsets. But I, you know, when I'm camping on the river, then I, sunrises I, ha, I am forced to look at. And they're beautiful. But I, I think you see different things at different times of day. So if you have that flexibility to stay near the river or visit it repeatedly throughout the day, you, send, you tend to see more wildlife activity in the morning and in the evening. So just after sunrise, just before sunset, in the middle of the day, especially if it's hot, most of the animals like us are pretty, they're laying around and taking it easy. Right. So would you would you recommend that state park then for people to stay for extended period of time? Or is there another town that would be kind of give you a good jumping off point? If you're, you know, if you're driving in an RV or a camper of some kind or looking to camp there, the state parks are a pretty good option. In both Minnesota and Wisconsin, you have to pay a fee, an entrance fee, a vehicle fee to get in, plus you pay for the campsite. And they charge a different nightly rate depending upon if you're a resident or a non-resident. Okay. So those can get a little expensive. Uh, uh, there's a, a hack I found. like uh, you can do. Re- so this is the other thing about it. Is like if you reserve online, there's another fee for that as well. <laughs> but if you call the same day, they have a, a reservation number you can call, and you don't usually pay that reservation fee then if you call the same day, just taking a chance that there's going to be something available. The Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, operate some recreation areas along the Mississippi too, and they tend to be less expensive. There's no fee to get in. They do charge an, a camp fee per night. They tend to be a little, a little more 
crowd of <laughs> events. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our experience with Army Corps of Engineer camping is that it's a little more rustic. Some of them are pretty rustic. There are some along the river that have no services at all, but they do have some full service campgrounds too. Uh, it's just the sites tend to be a little close together for my tastes. And then there are, there are some parks, some areas where there's a backcountry camping. So I can think of a couple of state parks where, you know, you grab your backpack and like Itasca State Park is one of them. I've done this a couple of times. You can hike two or three miles away from where you parked and be out in the middle of the wilderness and, and camp and have nobody around you. So there are a few opportunities like that too. Awesome. So, I mean, it sounds like then, I mean, you kind of have the wide range, right? So if you need to find... Like you said, a lodge or a cabin or something like that, you, they've got you covered. But if you want the complete backcountry experience, well, let's move into fall. So let's say, I mean, typically in the fall, people only have time for like long weekend trips. So where should we head for a long weekend trip in the fall? I'm definitely going to send them back to the Driftless area for that. So fall is, it surprises a lot of people, but fall is really the busiest travel time along the upper Mississippi because okay. colors, you know, it may not quite. Mm-hmm be like New England, but we do have some pretty brilliant fall colors along the Mississippi. And, and besides that, it's harvest season. So there are lots of farmers markets there are lots of roadside stands with people selling fresh produce, uh, end of season produce. And you, you know, it's, that's a good cheap way to stock up your, uh, your pantry too. Or, you know, if you're, if you're camping and you just want fresh food to cook with, there are lots of places to do that. So fall is I, I really like going north to the Driftless area, which is a little more rugged, again, a little more wilder, a little more open spaces and places. The accommodations tend to book up pretty early. So if you're going to be there on a weekend, uh, I would definitely advise getting a reservation in, in advance as soon as you can. Traveling at the last minute, you may not have a lot of choices or you may have to go further away from the river to find a place to stay. So, so yeah. Uh, you could go, like, that's a good time to be further south, too. The weather is really you know, much more pleasant in Mississippi and Louisiana. So I think that's a good time to visit some of those places, the National Wildlife Refuges on the lower part of the Mississippi. Uh, although, you know, when I was doing the research for this book, I was there at the end of September and it was still 100 degrees. <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, probably until you get to November, it stays pretty hot in the in the south. So. Yeah. Well, awesome. So now what was so interesting is, and I don't remember exactly where I read it in the book, but you mentioned strapping on a pair of snowshoes and walking somewhere. So tell us where, where's your pick for winter or maybe a couple of different places again, maybe for a long, you know, long weekend trip or somebody looking for something for their Christmas break. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people are averse to cold. So the idea of going north in the wintertime may seem counterintuitive. Yeah, New Orleans obviously is going to be a fun place to be in the winter time. And so I'll just say the obvious: like if you if you want decent you know weather and you don't want to have to bundle up, then the lower part of the river, especially places around Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Vicksburg, and that stretch, are going to be awesome places to visit that time of year. And there's no shortage of things to do down there. If you want more of a winter experience, if you want to live like a local a little bit or get a taste of what it's like in the middle of January up north. Up so one of my favorites is Itasca State Park again. They have a few lodges that are cabins that stay open year round. As the last time I checked, they were $100, $110 a night. And the park also offers snowshoes for free. Or maybe there's a small fee now, but you can you can rent snowshoes there. There are some cross country ski trails if you have cross country skis. You're not going to have very many people around you. So you can have like this outdoor winter experience with with uh, the birds that are still up there and maybe hear a wolf howling and and then enjoy you know a, a nice fire and hot cocoa or whatever your beverage of choice is when you get back to your, your cabin. So uh, that's nice. And you can have different kinds of winter experiences up there. Snowmobiles are really popular. There aren't always places that rent those. So you may need to make a friend who will take you out on their snowmobile. Uh, <laughs> but I enjoy going up there in winter almost as much as I enjoy leaving there in winter and going back to warmer weather. So, Well, that's neat because I don't think that we would think of, you know, as many people think of going skiing and that kind of thing. But if, if you're, you know, would be more interested in, in, like you said, having that experience and doing some, yeah, cross country type stuff for the, the snowshoes and just enjoying the snow. So very cool. 
So then that leads us into spring, and that seems like that would be a really cool time to be in different parts of the Mississippi. I, you know, I think my dream trip might be like, I don't know, February or so, starting in New Orleans and just taking my time and working my way up river. There's, you know, spring is fantastic because of the songbird migration and there's a lot of waterfowl on the move too, but it's just, you get to see things coming back to life. The trees start to bud back out. There are lots of wildflowers in bloom and the forest floors, and then the birds are really coming back in big numbers. So I, I would probably start, you know, at one of the public lands in the southern reaches of the, the Mississippi, Louisiana or Mississippi or Arkansas, and spend some time down there. February might be a touch early. Maybe March would be a little better time to start. And uh, you have to pay attention to the river levels then, too. Some of the places in this book tend to flood. And along the lower Mississippi, high water season can start as early as January and may go until May. It just varies from year to year. It doesn't usually go much longer than that. But the water can still be pretty high in March and April. So some places may not be accessible. Some of the wildlife refuges that are really basically just a few feet above, you know, the river to, right now could be underwater. So you've got to, if there are places that you're really set on visiting that time of year, you need to check the water levels or check with the parks or refuges to make sure they're, they're open and not flooded. And one thing that's great about the way that you have this book, I mean, you've got all the information in there too, right? So if you're looking at that one specific place, you've got the addresses you can look up, you've got phone numbers to, you know, contact so that you can, you can call and say, Hey, what is it? You know, what will we realistically be able to do as well? So that, that's how, you know, based on what you're saying, then starting in, in New Orleans and moving up, then taking the book along and using it to, you know, kind of plan your trip and kind of pick and choose. Because obviously, unless you have a lot of time, you're not going to hit all 166 plus places, but you can kind of pick and choose, you know, based on your interest. Yeah. And if you start maybe late spring and, you know, over a week or so, you might still see pretty good change from the south up to St. Louis and a little further north. So, you know, spring can be really variable up in this part of the country. So, some, you know, in St. Louis, some years we have spring in March, and some years it's still cold in early May. So I, I can't guarantee good weather for any of these things. But this year we had a very early spring, and the, bar, the birds in particular started migrating earlier than normal, and a lot of wildflowers bloomed earlier than usual. Um, so yeah, if, if those are things that are really important to you, then I would say do a little bit of research on what the weather's been like so you know what, you, what you're likely to see when you go there. So I wanted to ask you, I, I read that you have done some like Mississippi River cruise, like gone on them as like a lecturer and things like that. Because I know that doing a road trip or camping or, you know, moving from place to place is not going to be easy for everybody. Right. So talk to us a little bit about your experience with one of these river cruises. Who's it good for? Like, are you a fan, not a fan, et cetera? Uh, I'm a fan. Yeah, I was. I thought it was fantastic. I did, I forget how many, a, f- a handful of guest lecture excursions with the American Queen, which is no longer in service. That company went out of business earlier this year, and that boat is now owned by American Cruise Lines with their competitor. We don't know what's going to happen yet with that boat. Um, the river cruises are, they're a good niche. Like you don't, you get to see a lot of the river's wildlife from the boat. You can see the forest I don't know how often, you know, sometimes you may not see a lot of birds, but in some places you may see some, but they take good care of you. You know, the food's good. The accommodations are good. You don't have to work very hard. They tend to skew a little older demographically. I could go on one of those cruises now and I probably would still feel like a young man. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so I think that's great for people that like to travel, but may may not have the mobility they used to have, or maybe not the desire to suffer through some of the hassles we all have to deal with when we travel. So they're fantastic for that. There's, I guess, we're at two main companies now. So American Cruise Lines does cruises and Viking does cruises on the Mississippi also. Okay. And then from what I read, I just did a little bit of research. You can usually do like the upper Mississippi or the lower Mississippi. And then there are some, if you have a long time, you can, you could cruise the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, so. A lot of people that, listen to our podcast, there are the people that are going to travel to Europe and do a Rhine River cruise, or they're going to go to 
Egypt and do the Nile. And, you know, so I, you know, I think opening this and potentially opening people's eyes that right here in our own backyards, we've got another magnificent river um, that would be good to cruise is a good, is really a good eye opener for people. And it's a similar experience too, where you have stops at various ports and you have opportunities to get off and do tours around the cities. You're right. They tend to break them into the lower Mississippi versus the upper Mississippi. Some of them have a focus. A lot of the lower Mississippi cruises will focus on Civil War history. So there'll be lectures from experts on Civil War history, for example. The upper Mississippi, they tend to start cruising there more the late summer. Um, and then through fall is very popular again because of the, the colors, the, the leaves. So the upper Mississippi cruises tend to be a little later in the season, but the lower miss, they cruise pretty much all year. Great. Well, one of the things that we usually ask Melissa to give us is a packing list, right? And I know it's going to depend a little bit on season of what people need to pack. But what are some essential things that you would say that year round people should pack with them if they're going to go and visit these places on the Mississippi? Hiking shoes, I think, would be essential. Some of the places, um, they could be muddy. So I, I make sure I have a separate pair of shoes I put on before I go for a hike. So if they do get, if I do get slogged through the mud, then I can take them off when I get back to the car. A towel <laughs> to wipe off. Uh, I, I, you know, there, there are going to be bugs, especially in the floodplain forests, if you're anywhere in that part of the river. So if, you, if mosquitoes bother you, then you'll want to bring bug spray. I just tend to dress in long sleeves and wear long pants and I don't usually put bug spray on and I wear a hat so ticks can be an issue but usually if I with a hat on it's not usually I don't really have a problem with ticks so there are those kinds of precautions to dress for for being outside for a little bit if it's going to be hot bring some water along so have some portable water bottles a camera you're going to want to take pictures of things so if you're a photographer bring a camera along I'm not really that much of an expert at identifying plants and birds. So I have a couple of apps on my phone that I use to help me out. I use one called Seek to help me identify plants that works reasonably well. And then for birds, there's an app called Merlin I use that identifies birds based on their songs. I'm partially colorblind, so I'll probably never be a legit birder as it is because the colors would be lost on me. But I find bringing those two things along really enriches the hikes because it helps me understand more so just how varied the life is around me. So those are some essentials for sure. I love in your podcast, you talked about opening Merlin and just let it, you know, listen and then have it tell you what kind of birds are around you and in the area. Because even here, often we go out for walks because we have some greenway spaces and you'll hear these birds and it's like, oh, what is that? Because that's just, you know, that's really cool. So I have made note of Merlin and uh, I haven't downloaded it yet. But but Seek, that was the other one. Uh, you said it works offline. So it has yep. a, a database. So if you're in an area where you don't have good cell coverage and stuff like that, it can still identify plants. Both of them work whether you have cell service or not. Seek tries to add a geolocation to your sightings. So it'll get, you know, in places where I've been without cell service, it kind of spins for a little bit until it recognizes there's no cell service and then it'll tell me what, what it is I just saw. But that doesn't happen too often. I, just, I think they're fantastic. Like I, there are A lot of mornings when I'm camping, the, as soon as the light hits and I can hear birds around me, I'll roll over and turn on my phone and open up Merlin and let it listen for a little while, like you said. And it's just fun to watch the, the names of these birds just popping up on my screen. Oh, that is really neat. I'm glad you mentioned that because Scott actually had had that in the notes after we had listened to the podcast. Very cool. Well, so we like to end each interview session by asking each guest three questions. And so everybody answers the same three questions. First one is, what is your favorite place that you've ever visited? And it doesn't have to be on the Mississippi. Mm. That is a hard question. I've been lucky enough to travel to about 40 countries, and I'm only missing one U.S. state. I still need to get to Rhode Island. Uh, favorite place I've ever been, I, I really love Vietnam. I'll put that up near the top of my list. We've heard that. Yeah. There are others that I, I've really enjoyed probably as much, but 
uh, we had a great time in Vietnam. Very cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That, I, it was surprising, but we've actually heard that from, from others as well. Yeah. So you're not alone. So tell us, what are the top spots on your bucket list, places you've never been that you would like to visit? Well, right now, I think, you know, hopefully this may, is going to happen next summer, but I want to go to Africa and I want to, I want to see, you know, the big five. I want to do a, a safari of some kind. Uh, uh, and uh, I, there's a company called Intrepid Travel, and maybe you're familiar with, they do kind of small group tours and not the big, you know, the tours with bigger footprints. Yeah. So we're looking at maybe doing something with them next year to knock that off the bucket list. But I really, really want to do that. So we're doing that this this fall. Yeah. Nice. Um, so we'll have to catch back up with you and share our experiences and, of course, the, the photos. Yeah, I look forward to that. There's probably at least one podcast episode out of that. It will be more. at least one. Uh, <laughs> yes, if not more than one. That That's definitely been on our bucket list. So what do you have planned right now? Where are you going next? Or do you have anything planned right now? Um, you know, a lot of my travel this summer is going to be promoting the book, but I will be going north. I'm actually trying to figure out a place to go for a couple of days for a little break, but it will be somewhere along the Mississippi. Where it ends up being will depend on how much time I ultimately have. I have a couple of my favorite spots to go camp near the river that are almost always not crowded. And I tend to I keep those my secrets or maybe I'll tell them a, a, a personal friend about it. Probably the big trip for this year is I try to get some friends together to do a canoe trip on the Mississippi uh, every summer. And so we're looking at maybe September doing a maybe a three-night trip, maybe south of St. Louis. We're still trying to work out where. Okay, very cool. So tell us then for your promoting your book and where you'll be this summer, where kind of will you be? And then where can people go find those locations like is there a website or landing page or something like that we can send people to so uh, the mississippi valley traveler.com mississippi valley traveler.com is my website and i have travel information on there for the upper part of the river i keep my events on there as well so you can look on there to see where i'm going to be that's probably the best place to go to keep track of all that i do post some things on social media on Facebook, I'm the Mississippi Valley Traveler, and I have events. I, I try to get those posted and updated in there, too. So those are good places to track where I'm going to be. So far, most of what I have booked is around St. Louis and, and north. A few places in Iowa, uh, one up in Minnesota coming up in June. Hopefully, there'll be more of that. I'm still trying to work on some dates on the lower part of the river. But probably, as we said, probably in the fall, probably not in the summer. <laughs> Yes. So we will put some links in the show notes to your website, to your podcast. And then obviously for the book, which when the podcast airs, it will be out, uh, out available for purchase. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. A matter of fact, it'll, it should air the same day as it's released. So we're kind of excited about the timing of that. Yes. Awesome. Well, Dean, is there anything else that you would want to share, would want to leave us with? you know, just what thoughts about the book or about the Mississippi in general? Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about with this is I, I really do think one of the, like the main joys of visiting the Mississippi come from slowing down and really taking time to look around and look at the details, pay attention to what's around you. Mountains, you know, they're easy to appreciate. They're majestic. They're big. You know, they, they command our attention. But with the Mississippi, I think we have to kind of really slow down and really pay attention to what's around us before we really begin to, to fully appreciate the world that it supports. So I hope people will do that. They'll take the book and they'll just uh, maybe a, a lawn chair or something and they'll sit for a little bit and spend some time looking around them and listening and, and seeing what they can discover about the world of Mississippi. Awesome. I don't think I could summarize it any better than that. Dean, thank you for joining. Thank yeah. you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So we wanted to talk to Dean about raising awareness of the Mississippi River as a travel destination, maybe a place for inspiration, rejuvenation, and relaxation. So this episode really hit home for me because when I was growing up, my family would take a lot of road trips, especially in the summer. We did a lot of camping and visiting state parks and national historic sites and things like that. Both of my parents were teachers, so we had the time to do that in the summer. But then also we didn't typically fly places. And so that's really familiar with for me, right? Camping in state parks and go into these different parks. So this episode really and, and our conversation with Dean really excited me to 
you know, maybe do a road trip and go back and, and explore some of the Mississippi and along the Mississippi this way. Yeah. And as I said in the interview, never thought about the north end of the Mississippi and some of the major cities that are on the river. We've talked about Mississippi in terms of in Mississippi or in New Orleans, Louisiana, you know, places like that, but not those north end like Minnesota and places coming down the river. So if you happen to be in one of these cities for a work trip or, you know, passing through on your summer vacation, you might want to extend that and add a, an extra few days. Maybe like if you're in New Orleans or St. Louis or Minneapolis, stop in and spend a few days around the Mississippi and explore some of the places in the guidebook. Yes, for sure. And I really think this has encouraged me to want to do that. Possibly like he talked about in the summer, flying up there and then taking that drive up to Minnesota and visiting the headwaters of the Mississippi Lake Itasca. That just sounds really interesting to me. And I haven't been to Minnesota and Wisconsin and some of those states either. But I was also super intrigued by the part where he talked about, you know, getting out in your snowshoes or doing the cross country skiing and, and maybe using it as a, you know, a winter destination too. Yeah, I never even thought about that. So we're going to put a link to Dean's book, The Wild Mississippi, in our show notes. We encourage you to purchase this book and use it as a resource in planning your trip to one of the many places that he highlights to help you uncover the wild Mississippi. After that conversation with Dean, listening to his podcast and reading his book, I think you and I are going to have to work in some weekend visits to a few of the places that he mentioned. How about you? Do you have any travel stories of visiting the mighty Mississippi? Send them to me, scott at sunshinetravelers.com. We are always inspired by your adventures. When you're looking at booking your reservations for a trip like this, we definitely recommend using booking.com because you can choose from over a million properties worldwide, from cozy country homes to sleek city apartments. You can find the best deals with their price match promise. Enjoy great stays at lower cost. And because flexibility matters, you can book with confidence knowing that you can cancel with ease. And make informed choices with millions of reviews from fellow travelers. Start your adventure now. Visit sunshinetravelers.com slash booking to book your perfect stay. Using this affiliate link to book your lodging helps support our podcast and allows us to continue to provide new content each week. Please consider using this link when booking your next travel. There's no extra cost for you and we are compensated through the affiliate. We hope you enjoyed this episode and found some inspiration to help you with your travel journeys. If you could take a moment to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform, it would be greatly appreciated. Your five-star reviews help us get discovered by others and possibly featured on your favorite platform. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to our podcast to get notified of new episodes as they are released. You can also find us on Instagram as Sunshine Travelers Podcast. Remember, that is Travelers with one L. Most importantly, please share it with your friends to help them catch the travel bug. You never know, they may become your greatest travel companion.